Hello, my name is Imogen Tyler. I'm a professor of sociology at Lancaster University. This session explores the following questions. What are enclosures? What is the relationship between the enclosures of land and people within England and within English colonies that are taking place at the same time? And why is the global colonial history of enclosures important for understanding the making of the modern world? So you may have heard the word enclosure before and perhaps have been taught about English land enclosures, for example, as part of a history curriculum at school. One of the aims of this session is to unsettle nation bound historical understandings of enclosures in England by developing a more expanded global understanding of enclosures, in particular by thinking about the relationship between land enclosures within England and colonial land enclosures in the plantation economies of the West Indies, Americas, India and beyond as connected elements in a global archipelago of enclosures which expanded with the British Empire from the 16th century onwards. If you look at the pictures on this slide, you, we can see how we might begin to visualise this relationship between land enclosures within England and colonial land enclosures. These, in, these images show two different scenes of English enclosures and resistance to enclosures in the mid 17th century. In the first image, English peasants are depicted being attacked and forced off the land in the mid 17th century by armed militia acting for English aristocrats who are intent on enclosing, that is privatising the land. In the second image is a detail from a 1657 map of Barbados, an English colony in the Caribbean from 1627, and it depicts land enclosed as plantations and escaped enslaved men being hunted down by an English colonist on horseback. It's useful to keep these two images of English land enclosures in mind and also to keep the people in these images in mind too, English peasants and enslaved Africans, for as well as stretching the concept of enclosures to think about colonisation, this session will also expand the concept of enclosures from a focus on land to consider the enclosure of people and people's resistance to it. I want to begin with a story that illustrates in microcosm some of the themes of this session, but on the connections between land enclosures in England and in English colonies. In 1757, a child called Joshua Hind was born in Lancaster, a port town in Lancashire, northwest England, and the small city where I live and work, and I'm recording this lecture today. When Joshua Hine was seven years old, his family's black servant, Harry Hind, escaped from his home. We know this, and if you look at the slide, you can see this, because there was a runaway slave advertisement printed in a newspaper, which stated, run away from Lancaster on Friday the 23rd day of November last. A Negro man named Harry, about 20 years old, five feet four inches high, strong made and one of his ears bored. It details that Harry absconded in the night without his clothes and was thought to be headed for London. Whoever secures him, it said, shall be well rewarded and all expenses paid by Mr James Hind, a merchant in Lancaster, and Joshua's father. At this period in the mid-18th century, Lancaster was the fourth largest slave trading port in England and a significant centre for bilateral trade with the West Indies. It's possible that Harry had been brought into Lancaster Port on a slave ship as privileged cargo, a macabre bonus system that allowed slave ship captains to bring one or two enslaved people back to Britain to sail into domestic service. The presence of black servants in 18th century portraiture, most often boys, like you can see in this image here, reveals how fashionable it was to own a black servant in this period. In fact, there's a Lancaster baptismal record from 1761 for a black teenager called Harry Hind, which suggests he may have arrived that year on a slave ship called the Lancaster that was captained by Joshua's uncle. 
the Hind family were a Lancastrian slave trading and plantation owning dynasty. When he grew up, Joshua joined the family slavery business, employed as an agent selling cargoes of enslaved people landed by English slave ships in the West Indies, and later as a manager on a sugar plantation in Grenada, an island in the Caribbean that was a British colony from 1763 until 1974. By 1809, Joshua was the co-owner of a slave ship with his cousins. A wealthy man, he'd permanently settled back in Lancaster, buying a house in the town's finest square and purchasing up parcels of local land. He applied for and obtained a Parliamentary Enclosure Act. I'll return to these in the moment. To turn a large area of common land on the outskirts of Lancaster on which local people had formerly been able to graze their animals into a private agricultural and shooting estate. This is the same land on which Lancaster University, where I teach and work, sits today. Joshua's social position was cemented when he became a justice of the peace, a role that involved him passing sentences of hard labour on the poor for petty offences such as pilfering apples, crimes of hunger and poverty that were common in 18th and 19th century England and were often prompted in part by land enclosures that removed working people's access to land for full food and fuel. So what are enclosures? In a literal sense, enclosures refers to the process through which landowners close off land from public access or use by digging trenches or putting up barriers such as hedges, walls or fences to stop people or their animals accessing or living on that land. The term enclosure is normally used in the context of English history to describe how landowners gathered together parcels of land into large fields, enclosing them with the stated aim or stated aim of improving the land to increase yields of crops. Sometimes they replaced the people who worked on the land with sheep as profits in the woolen industry grew. Enclosures often refer in particular to the enclosure of common land, whereby the people's customary rights to access and use land that is held sort of in common uh, to graze pigs, poultry or cows or collect food is removed. It also re refers to the fencing off of areas such as forests that people have previously been able to forage in for full, uh, fuel and food. And these forests are fenced off the exclusive use of aristocrats, for example, as hunting estates. Enclosures also refers sometimes to the clearance of land by the eviction, sometimes violently, of people from their homes and the refusal to renew people's tenancies on small holdings and farms, which might have been in families for generations. These evictions happened en masse in Scotland in the Highland Clearances and in Ireland. In short, beginning in the 13th century and reaching its height at the end of the 18th and early 19th century, enclosures comprised the systematic privatisation of land in England, and the Enclosure Act of 1773, uh, which sort of smoothed, made this a legal process, which um, through Parliament vastly accelerated this process. But if we go back a little further, before the Tudor Reformation in the 16th century, abbeys and monasteries had owned about a third of the cultivated land in England and their dissolution by Henry VIII greatly accelerated the enclosure movement as the crown seized land and sold it off to loyal aristocrats. As the printer and poet Robert Crowley reflected in 1550, after the Reformation, working people were increasingly held to ransom by those he describes as the great farmers, the men of law, the merchants, the gentlemen, the knights, the lords. These men, Crowley laments, take our houses from over our heads they buy our grounds out of our hands, they raise our rents, they levy unreasonable fines, they enclose our commons. Men that would have all in their hands, men that would leave nothing for others, men that would eat up men, women and children. Enclosures, as Crowley describes it here in the mid 
16th century were basically a massive land grab by the rich that fundamentally changed the meaning of the land beneath our feet as land, forests, open uncultivated moorland, rivers and lakes came to be understood as private property belonging to individual landowners. And this replaced a kind of previous feudal understanding of land as something which manorial lords, arist aristocrats and kings ruled over and were caretakers of, but the bounty of which was in some sense a God-given natural wealth that people had some common if differential rights to access and use. As land was commodified as property, social and economic relationships between people were transformed. While the benefits of enclosure remain disputed amongst historians, with some pointing to increases in agricultural pro productivity, Robert Allen and others have argued that actually land enclosures brought few, if any, benefits, but greatly enriched landowners. Indeed, food shortages, famines and starvation became ever larger social issues. People were forced to migrate from their villages, becoming vagrants, beggars and paupers, and resorting to squatting, stealing and poaching on newly enclosed land to survive. Harsh new laws against the poor attempted to control these newly disenfranchised groups. People fiercely resisted enclosures. One massive instance of resistance was the Midland Revolts of 1607, a series of 11 uprisings which saw thousands of people protesting land enclosures. As Nick Hayes summarises, the Midlands had been ravaged by enclosure. With nowhere else to go, many were squatting on the side of fields they'd lived on a decade earlier. In Rocky and Forest alone, 27,000 acres had been enclosed. 350 farms destroyed and almost 150,000 people across 18 villages had lost their homes. The term diggers, those who sought to dig out new hedges or dig in and squat on the land, and levellers, those who sought to literally level land, tearing down hedges and fences, but also to level social relations, first emerged in printed pamphlets at around this time, to describe those who opposed enclosures. So you can see on the slide here, a petition by the diggers of Warwickshire who talk about these encroaching tyrants who would grind our flesh upon the whetstone of poverty so they may dwell themselves in their herds of fat weathers or sheep only for their own private gain. They've depopulated and overthrown whole towns and made thereof sheep pastures. Now, the Midland Revolts were a hugely significant moment in English history in which common people engaged in open armed conflict against the landed gentry. In one battle, the Newton Rebellion, a thousand commoners facing starvation camped on newly enclosed land. A militia was sent to disperse them. Troops charged, killing over 40 peasants. The ringleaders were tried, hanged and quartered and their limbs were displayed and taken on a macabre tour of the local towns and villages as a warning to others. Land enclosures in England coincided with English-led enclosures of land and people overseas, especially in Africa and what later became the US and Canada. So in 1562, John Hawkins led the first English slave trading voyage to Africa, supported by Queen Elizabeth I, who gifted him the arms you can see in this image that depict an enslaved African in chains to commemorate his lucrative slave trading voyages. In 1607, the same year as the Midland Revolts, the colony of Virginia was established. Virginia was enclosed by a company set up by King James I, the same king who, who granted permission to the militia in um, Northamptonshire to slaughter English peasants, resisting enclosures. In short, the same class of people that led enclosures within England, aristocratic landowners supported by the crown, were involved in establishing the English-led slave trade and, and colonialism. So we can begin to trace a relationship between what was happening within England and colonial practices of enclosure, 
the enclosure of people in slave ships, their forced transportation to European colonies as a labour force, the enclosure of land in America and the West Indies into new plantation economies, the theft of land and the violent displacement of indigenous people from it. We can also start to see a kind of wider relationship between enclosure and forced or coerced migrations of different kinds, not only within England, where rural peasants um, started migrating to newly industrialising towns um, as, as land was enclosed and they were displaced, but also the global movement of people and goods. So, for example, one solution proposed to the problem of poverty and vagabondage created by the mass displacement of people from homes and land within England in, from the 17th century was indentured servitude in the new colonies. Indentured servitude was first used in Virginia in 1609. The Virginia company would pay for the cost of your travel to the new world and you paid off your debt to the company by working for a colonist um, but for an indenture term of between one and seven years. At the end of that term, you'd be given your freedom dues, which could be money or a small plot of land. And many became planters and colonialists, um, the, these indentured servants. But the conditions were so harsh, mortality rates were so high that not enough English peasants could be recruited into this servant labour force for colonists in the new world. And indenture shifted into a punishment. So, for example, transportation to a colonies might be offered to you um, as an alternative to execution if you're prosecuting the English courts. From the early 18th century until the American Revolution, Britain transported around 50,000 convicts to Maryland and Virginia. This was, of course, a tiny labour force when considered in relationship to 3.5 million enslaved Africans transported by British slave ships. Slavery and indenture are distinctly different forms of labour exploitation, but they are connected in time and in place and they are shaped by colonial capitalist enclosures within England and in the West Indies and Americas. In a highly influential work of social history called The Making of the English Working Class, E.P. Thompson details how land enclosures within England led to the formation of a new political class consciousness as working people began to understand that their interests were opposed to that of the ruling property classes. Thompson focused on the period 1780 to 1832, when land enclosures were at their most intensive in England, and when parliamentary enclosures had smoothed the legal process of enclosing land. This is a history from below, a radical history, the foregrounds, the squatters and food rioters, the levellers and Luddites, whose struggles against enclosures led to the making of an English working class. But this book is also a partial account, an island provincial story that effectively obscures the context of slavery, colonialism and empire within which this new class society unfolded. Indeed, this version of the history of working people's struggles against enclosure and the formation of a working class in England has become something of a myth of class and state formation. In actuality, as Eric Willems argued much earlier in his book Capitalism and Slavery in 1944, by 1750, every trading and manufacturing town in England had connections of some kind to plantation slavery. And it's the profits from the colonial enclosures of land and people that were a major source of the capital that financed the enclosure of land in England in the 18th and early 19th century and the building of those Lancashire mills and factory towns that transformed England into a modern capitalist state. Histories of the development of England as a nation state are often presented as progress stories relating, for example, how agricultural revolutions and industrial revolution and new industries of textiles, coal and steel ushered in an age of abundance, democracy and opportunity 
even while emphasising some of the short-term human costs of these changes for those men, women and children caught in exploitative factory systems and dwelling in industrial slums. So this image you can see here is the BBC Bite Size Revision page uh, image used to visually summarise the Industrial Revolution in Key Stage 3 curriculum. This national history focuses, as we can see, on the innovative technological leaps afforded by steam-powered spinning looms and the like. However, when we reframe enclosures within the global lens of slavery, colonialism and empire, a different picture emerges of Britain as an imperial state. We cannot understand the history of the industrial capitalism separately from the history of slavery and colonialism. We cannot separate Lancashire's cotton mills from the Lancashire-owned slave factories on the African coast and the Lancashire-owned cotton plantations. They form part of the same archipelago of enclosure and exploitation. The unpaid labour of the enslaved was the source of surplus value the structured the free but exploited wage labour of the English working class. That is, the ability of, the free, of a free-born Englishman to sell his own skin for a wage was grounded in the radical unfreedom of others. Plantation slaves, ensurfed agricultural workers, indentured coolie workers, child labourers, wage factory workers and workhouse paupers are, as Walter Johnson puts it, concretely intertwined elements of a larger unified though internally diversified structure of exploitation. Chattel slavery and plantation labour are as formative in the formation and structuring of English class society as the enclosure of common land and the exploitations attendant with the growth of industrial capitalism in English factories and mills. Over the last decade, our understanding of the history of Britain has been transformed by new histories of slavery, colonialism and empire, and by new digital research tools and databases. Catherine Hall describes this shift as bringing race and slavery home by following the money and people and exhuming facts that have previously been suppressed, marginalised or disavowed. This research is challenging received sociological accounts of the formation of English capitalist society and associated theories of social class. I began this session with Joshua Hines' story of social mobility, from son of a Lancaster woolen merchant to slave trader, planter, gentleman landowner and justice of the peace. And also with the story of Harry, an enslaved man brought to Lancaster from Africa against his will and escaped in the night from the clutches of this deeply evil family. I began here as it illustrates concrete material connections between the rise of this powerful new middle class in England, land enclosures in England and the enclosure of land in colonial plantations and people, slavery in the colonial world. The more expansive account of enclosures I've begun to develop in this session decenters E.P. Thompson's account of the making of the working class in England by revealing how a global, multi ethnic working class was made through empire. A working class comprised not only of levellers, weavers, machine breaking Luddites, but of child labourers, impressed sailors scullery maids, indentured convicts, black servants and indentured and enslaved plantation workers and runaways like Harry Hind who continually resisted their capture within the machinery of colonial capitalism. Understanding how a multi-ethnic working class was made through empire gives us new ways of thinking about class and race as intertwined systems of human classification which emerge through the enclosure of land and people in England and overseas, and from people's struggles for freedom against the extractive mechanisms of colonial capitalism on a global scale. Today, multinational corporations dominate the global economy. These new empires and the global billionaire class whose interests they serve are extracting what remains of the Earth's natural resources 
Land is enclosed, forests are swallowed up, the oceans are poisoned while the planet warms uncontrollably. The wealth of these corporations is so vast, their power now dwarfs that of most nation states and their deepening political influence has seen the mass privatisation, that is the enclosure of formerly public goods such as education, social care and health services in countries around the world. Rethinking enclosures matters because of what it reveals about how colonial enclosures have shaped and continue to shape reduced life expectancy and life chances of working people within Britain and within former British colonies today. We need a better understanding of this history in order to apprehend the new enclosure movements of the 21st century.